I have been known to get excited. Not start the recording. Hi, everybody. I'm really glad to welcome you to our Thursday book launch. Um, tonight, we get to celebrate with Judy Cronenfeld. Um, if you haven't heard her read before, you're in for a treat. I'm glad that everybody is here. I'm going to do a brief bio. I know my internet is wonky. I apologize. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video so that um, at least the audio is okay. Um, mm -hmm. Ju Judy Cronenfeld's six full-length books of poetry, including include groaning and singing, which was from, um, you got that, Karen? Can you get the person out of the waiting room? Yep. Um, groaning and singing, which we got to celebrate last year. That came from Future Cycle 2022, Birds Flying Through the um, Banquet, Future Cycle 2017, and Shimmer, which was Word Tech 2012. Her poems have appeared in four dozen anthologies and in so many journals, including Cider Press Review, McQueen's Quinterly, New Ohio Re Review, Rattle, Tila Nagig, and Verdad. Judy has published criticism, including King Lear and the Naked Truth, which came out from Duke, and short stories and creative nonfiction, multi-talented, multi-genre writer. Mm -hmm. um, also forthcoming uh, in 2024, so that's two books, um, is her third chapbook, Oh Memory, You Unlock Cabinet of Amazements, and it's coming out um, from Bamboo Dart in June 2024. And her memoir, in essays, apartness from Inlandia Books in 2024 um, or 2025. And Judy, thank you so much for coming. I've been looking forward to this. I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you. I'm thrilled to welcome you back. Thank you, Malika. Let's see, let me make sure. I'm, I'm not muted, yay, okay. <laughs> I'm going to uh, first say how delighted I am to be here, Malika. I just love your Thursday afternoons. They have a terrific warm atmosphere that I genuinely appreciate. So great to be here. Um, I'm going to begin with the poem that has the title words in it. Uh, this poem is called Final Dissolve by Acclamation. And uh, I didn't know what acclamation meant until um, my much admired sister-in-law, my, my husband's baby sister, passed away after battling cancer for a long time. Um, and she was a, a terrific environmental activist. And so she chose this form of final disposition that has the least environmental impact uh, with a kind of bravery and stoicism that, um, and acceptance that I, we all thought was remarkable. Final dissolve by acclamation. If only there were stations of the air like the flamboyant clouds in Baroque paintings, around which putti peak in dizzying vistas, and necks craned back, we could count out the platforms of our apotheoses turning rose gold in the setting sun. If there were ladders like Jacob's, each rung festooned with blue bluebells and fuchsia, like something out of Fragonard. Each step, a light bounce upward, easy as the breeze, as a chorus of countertenor angels sings. But no, bitter as a slap against the cheek by the hand of someone adored, that last crossover, at first impossible to absorb. Our beloved's animated face, her moving hands, her joys to 2% of her original weight in white ash. Yes, it's a brutal, brutal poem. It's the way I feel about that change <laughs> that we all face. Um, and I guess this book, perhaps unlike uh, the bamboo dart one, really is a book of this moment in time, not necessarily because it discusses politics or anything like that, because it really doesn't, but because I think living 23, 24 is very difficult. It's, it, it, it's, it's a difficult time. And, and this book is about difficult things that I've tried to treat as honestly as I, as I can. Flowers growing in time lapse to music. In this spring of contagion, I get caught by those videos of the vegetable world 
with its own inexorable will, pushing up through heavy loam. Bent buds straightening and unfolding on stiffening stalks, dear as cramped bird heads stretching out of beak cracked eggs. <laughs> Just new petals flutter testing themselves, touching as birth wet calves stumbling up on shaky legs, and no decay. All the blind plants busy as an orchestra playing prestissimo almost fast enough for my mortal eye to imagine cotyledon to stunning blossom known all at once in timeless mind the barrier of becoming broken as if there were an instant plan for everything natural and it was perfectly beneficent a lot of as ifs in, and if onlys in my poems, I keep noticing. Mm. So as I said, this, this book covers some of the ravages of time that we all have to experience, get to experience um, as, we, as we move on on this wonderful, glorious and terribly distressing <laughs> earth. <laughs> I get news of your death, cousin, four decades after you disappear. And I remember your dad, rumored violent, who smiled and smiled and smelled of too sweet cologne. Your codependent mom, suspiciously bruised, who loved you so fiercely she kept you weak and always chose appearances over the truth and heart and mind damaged beautiful you left helpless and alone after their deaths then driving away help with your mad phone rants and i think of when we were girls and our families used to meet how each hand tried to climb the other's tree as you snuggled your fists under your chin your scribbling fingers caged hamsters turning their exercise wheels your own little player piano shivering a happy tune such a chill of pleasure to await your uncles and aunts embraces you were like a blue-lipped child just summoned from the sea shaking deliciously as she pictures being wrapped in fleece a nurse said you died alone, an old woman in a facility for adults, after 16 friendless years. How little a life can be. At a time when lonely death is legion and could be anyone's, whether loved by a host of friends and kin or last in the family line, I record your yard site in my book and try to think of you at peace. No naked wolf bearing down on the fold, no waves of rage, no heart like sea crushed shells. Changing the mood for a little bit, for, for a short bit, actually. This next poem mentions um, Israel, Palestine, uh, but was written well before the current horrific, beyond horrific war in Gaza, about which I have written in more recent poems. But I just wanted to say that somehow, because it's hard to mention Israel-Palestine without writing about the horrific aspect of it. And I don't in this poem. My husband and I live in inland California, which isn't, you know, California, California. <laughs> so... This poem is called, I Don't Think We Live in California. And it's changing the mood from what you've been listening to. We drove down from gray inland for the first time in two pandemic years, and now sit in our cover-up clothes that ward off dangerous sun like foreigners or anthropologists or like a couple of old codgers. Wait omit like on a bench overlooking a strip of beach in Laguna. 
The sun blinks behind clouds, then emerges the star of the afternoon. The mixture of breeze and warmth exhilarates, though we don't move. When did thong bikini bottoms become a thing? The young female bodies in front of us playing beach volleyball seem almost prepubescently thin, as if built for only the most parsimonious of coverings. The walkers stream by, the women jiggling like jello in their midriff bearing bandeau or a la mode in breezy pastel linen, elegant against bronze skin. Later, we wander into a Native American jewelry shop and find ourselves sharing our similar views on Israel-Palestine with the Palestinian owner. We are charmed and charming, I think, though he tells us he took us for out-of-state farmers when we first walked in. He almost, but doesn't say, hicks. Switching the tone back again to one of the subjects of this book, which is, uh, and, well, you'll see what it is. <laughs> Grace. This is a short poem. Grace. <clears throat> I see sharp-edged morning. The shattering bark of unseen dogs sends sudden birds flapping away in fast bursts. Almost swifter than my eye, one throttles back, engines at a dampened thrum near the leafless plum outside my study window, and floats to the close branch, delicately touching down with a grace I envy as my mind tries to flee, suspicious on a CT scan, which could shatter me. So we go from there to being right in the thick of this illness. Coming soon. Coming soon, crypts, niches, and graves, the cemetery sign shouts as I drive past on my way home from the hospital where I've seen the cardiothoracic surgeon alone because they said they wouldn't let you in as COVID surges. And did that sign actually add an exclamation point? What step right up sellers chutzpah? Or is the point implicit in the all too literal coming soon? My brain is noodling nodule equals lesion equals tumor, the incidental finding on a CT previously addressing something minor. Is it too soon to spill my limbo of raw fear to family and friends and risk having to swallow everything back, ashamed and never again to be believed? Or is the wolf not coming soon, but frothing at the door as the surgeon inclined to diagnose with scalpel seemed to imply, though unwilling to give odds, malign or benign? I want the lyre or glittering bow for a trial run underground, return trip guaranteed. Having brushed against the shades, mere wisps wafting through the vast, icy, unlit corridors, perhaps I'd emerge more acclimated to being dust. I need a primer on the lonely hospital bed and how to endure sentience there, a lesson in the blank stare of the clock, its perpetually stuttering hands. I need a guide to a body remote as an outpost taken over by strangers, a model of a soul without the mute animal comfort of touch. I need thee still when I'm at our door, with this foreign thing in my chest. Though seeing my uneasy face, you open your warm human arms. A different attitude in the next poem, 
um, there are conflicting attitudes in this book because we're full of contradictions. Hope because the gold stillness of late California afternoons, the stillness that is like spirit pulling in its breath for a moment, the breath it breathed into us and could breathe again, that expectant pours like slow oil over your head too. Because you are still walking the tightrope of your life in delicate shoes, though the net below, is there a net? Is invisible and balance is a miracle. Because light still grows in you and might emerge in startling bursts like sizzles and flashes from the farthest stars. Because your heart and mind are populated by all the dead you keep an altar for. The dead you visit in the reaches of dreams and you have your vigils mapped for years. Okay, a tiny poem now, uh, leaving a lot of blanks between the, <laughs> the interstices of this, this experience that I had. Together, you share my room three nights in the surgical ward, sleeping awkwardly on a fold-out chair as I doze in my opiate quieted bed. The soothing arms reach between us, all the sweetness we can know. This next poem is in a very short and a slightly different mode. It's a personification of bodily pain. Bodily pain sways over his beer in a bar. Familiar, presumptuous, he tells the same story over and over with slurred conviction. It's fresh to him, scandalous, astonishing, augural. He's a proselytizer for a church of one. Back and forth he rocks like a lonely bell, tolling, tolling on an island in the middle of the ocean. The next poem, again, the title very often in these poems segues into the first lines. Sometimes there's no freedom to love the world. Its slants of light, its glancingness requiring quick open arms. The sorrows of the body hood your eyes. Time places its heavy stones steadily around you, building, building, until there is only a small spot left for your body to curl into itself, its own prisoner in its cold hovel, where it dreams of galloping through the dark like a hero in a ballad, drinking in the flash and glint of dawn. I think this is the three poem marker. So again, thank you so much for hosting me, Malika. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for, for being here. It's a pleasure to see you. So two, one short one, a slightly longer one and another relatively short one. Okay. The Dead. We say, May their memories be for a blessing. We invoke their names many times as the years circle, always ending at a new place, like a spiral. We ask God to remember our ancestors and their merit when we pray for ourselves. But they fade. Even our images of them walk away from us, dimming like the plots of once loved books until they are less and more. An almost recognizable ray of sun touching our shoulders on a chill day of alternating brightness and drizzle. 
the kindness of the first lamps, lamps switched on in the smoke blue dusk. And this next to last poem is um, one that occurs towards the end of the book and it's really about the sort of the sum total of our experience in a way. And I want to say just to begin, um, as someone who grew up in New York, I, I know that the, uh, which has five boroughs, the sixth borough uh, was Miami for a lot of New Yorkers. It was thought of as the sixth borough. Deep travel. I was a child in a five borough garden of Eden city. The given new and crumbling, shining, grimy world. And I heard talk of sixth boroughs, places with the thickness of familiarity, places I imagined I could pass into with no resistance, the way ghosts pass through walls and 50s TV fantasies and be at home. And now so many once strange latitudes have addresses in my mind which light up warmly when I hear or read their names. Seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh boroughs, so different from the first through sixth, yet naturalized in the long durée of cumulative or extended visits. Sometimes there's a kind of placeless favorite weather in my dreams, jacket cool as June in Norway or autumn in the little park not far from our Bronx apartment light glancing, breeze tossed in the trees, and I don't know where I am. Or there's a rhythmic brilliance of magenta, flame, and lavender that could be the joyous spring decor in lamppost flower pots in almost any town in France. Or my long gone aunt's hanging baskets down dripping with impatience in her summer garden in Rosalind, Long Island. Sometimes I savor a sense of restful busyness in whatever task I'm carrying out, like the calm of Fonte fishermen mending their nets on the Ghanaian coast, their smooth backs gleaming in the sun. Sometimes my loneliness feels summed by a solitary red farmhouse casting its shadow on the snow on a spit of land jutting into a fjord or on the great plains of North Dakota. Some part of me yet hopes when I'm pulled across that last black frothing river, I will disembark with no resistance and be welcome in the final borough, the 12th perhaps. And I'll leave you with a poem called Leaving. Leaving, tone change again, you'll see, sort of. <laughs> if fire raged at the other end of my street and I had to escape, I would object. But my desk is a mess. Honestly, I need to Marie Kondo the whole house to find what to take. In the midst of war, I would speak up like that old woman in Bakhmut who resisted her rescuers, let's go, with, I need to pack grapes and maybe some sort of pancakes. Because even an apartment with no heat in a building blasted by a bomb pulses like a neutron star, home, home, home. When the angel of death arrives at my door with Lethe by IV, for my pain, my brain will obsess, but I haven't decided yet whether to leave my diaries to the kids or burn them. And there are dishes festering in the sink and we're going next week with our best friends to that new French rest. And that's what happens. <laughs> and that's it. Oh my gosh, I am just over ah. here speechless. I was trying to, you know, write so fast to keep up with my thoughts on everything. Judy, that was amazing. I, I think when you see the chat section, you're going to realize how on fire I can't we all were with, with your amazing poems. I, I am speechless and you know me well enough to know that doesn't happen. 
<laughs> but I have to say, it struck me this time, just your skill and your honesty and the clarity and the courage that you take in risking and writing these poems. It's so beautifully done. And I felt like sometimes when I hear a poet, I think, oh, they, it feels like a visual painting. Yours felt like a whole movie that I was in, like actually moving through. And I see some other people nodding. There is something so um, compelling in how you write. And I am in deep admiration. So if people have questions and can talk a little bit more clearly than I can at this moment, please jump in. Yeah, I, I'm just in awe of the, I had cancer two years ago, and the precision, the non, non-attachment, no emotion is overstated, nothing is held back, it's absolutely honest, crystal clear, so beautiful, so many moments that were just like that. Oh, thank you. And two years later, I still cannot even begin to find the words. Uh, wow. Thank you. Bless you for thank doing you. that. Thank I have you. to read this book. Thank you. Over and over. Um, I'm so afraid often of, of confronting these subjects because, you know, they're, they're not easily cheerful. <laughs> and I know many of us want to be cheered, especially in the world we live in now. But I have to confront them. But, and when we have to go through these things, it's sort of validating that someone said, I have permission to say these things because so often you, you feel like you have to hold back from saying it when you're going through it. Absolutely. For, for other people's sake. So thank you, Judy. Thank you. Um, may I say something? Yeah. Judy, I, I think um, it, what makes your poem necessary, and I'm so grateful you didn't try to be cheerful, is that, that what... In my mind, the poetry I love to read has a tension between real vulnerability without BS and it's kind of non-sentimental hopefulness. And it's those kinds of that tension that for me keeps me in the poem and doesn't say, oh, it's and leave. So yeah, I think you pulled that off. Thank you so much. I mean, it really gives me hope because honestly, just before reading, I'm going through the same thing in my head, which is I'm a little bit nervous about reading things that confront all the, the difficult things that we go through. But this is the age I'm at. Mm -hmm. And this is what's going on in my life. So Perfect. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I love how you said that, Amy. And I see other people echoing that same thing. Hetty said, so subtle and powerful at the same time, and your endings are absolutely wonderful. Fabulous reading. Yep, non sentimental hopefulness. I felt like somebody had a question, and I might have cut you off. I apologize. Jump in. No, I was just blurting. I just Judy. It was so. It, it, it yes, it was. It was so moving and just the just eloquent, clear truth. I think it's just why it was it was just so beautiful and I, I I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody it just your words touch hearts they're just so it's they're just it's real it's not you haven't sensationalized or it's there's just beautiful just thank you so much for sharing that you give me so much courage all of you honestly <laughs> thank you all that and courage. speaking of the book I know a lot of people are are, are putting in the chat section um, how to get a copy of the book. I've been using your um, website as a connection. Can they reach out to you to get a signed copy, Judy? Absolutely. Just just actually, my website is ho hopelessly out of date. It's a long story. So actually, if you Facebook message me, um, you know, that's the best thing to do. Just give me your address. It will take a little while. What I have now, um, where did it go, is the second proof. So it's going to be very soon that I'll have my copies, but it'll take a, a little while. And I, I should also put the, um, let me just give me one second, and I will put the address up of, um, one second, of course it disappeared, well, just when I need it. Okay. Ah! Yeah, and, um, I'll, I'll find it. Somebody asked the title of the book, If Only There Were Stations of the Air. 
Right. And I will find the um, the address on the Sheila and a gig website um, and put it up as soon as I do. OK, okay. so that'll take me a minute. So please go on. <laughs> No worries. Juan, you had a question? Oh, you're muted. Make sure you unmute. Hi, Judy. I Hi. Want, I, I, I love how you could speak about the difficult things with such tenderness. I, I was thinking of something William Stafford said about the, the fierceness of the edges of a leaf. Mm. I felt that. That is beautiful. Thank you. Okay. There, I've got, just, just excuse me to interrupt. Um, I've got the, uh, the website and there is a, a reduced price. It's quite a bit reduced until April 1st. So if you want to order from the website, which I just put up the URL, um, you know, that would be until April 1st, it's, it's about uh, almost $4 cheaper than it will be afterwards. Just, just a word. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question or comment? Okay, if I didn't see any in the chat section. So if, you, if people want to unmute and just take a moment to say, thank you so much, Judy. Thank you. I, I can't, you know, I, I can't wait to get a copy. Beautiful reading, beautiful. Thank you, thank you so much, all of you. I, I just so appreciate you. We're all vulnerable, and one of my vulnerabilities is worrying about not being cheerful. <laughs> and and, and uh, so there, there you have it. <laughs> There's something very cheering about the courage to speak about these things. Honestly, actually, that was very uplifting. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's an those... interesting thing. Yeah that balance right you know the idea of 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 kind of a a cheeriness that is probably a little it's disingenuous and i think there's a beautiful release and relief in the 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 way of um the human experience the way that you so articulate it with such clarity and such authenticity i don't know i say that's that that feels freeing to me whereas cheerfulness I feel unwelcome to show human, up as my full self. Human experience, what, human experience, I think, is the key phrase because human experience is not always cheerful. So we got to write about what we got to write about. Right? We have to tell the truth. Yeah. And that beautiful nature imagery, I can remember being in hospital treating rooms in various places and replaying in my mind a park I walked in or something because that made it possible. So yes. your poem has made me think of that. Yeah. It was so true. I think without poetry, even now, because there's still uncertainties and including health uncertainties, um, and without poetry, I think I wouldn't have made it through even this far. <laughs> so, I mean, thank God for it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, feel that strongly. Robbie said that um, she was uh, was talking about the, uh, you know, the cinematography, like a feel the the poems and Robbie do you want to did you want to mention something because that's something that struck me and I don't remember that well not in this book but I have written reviews of a couple of her past books and I have noticed that in the past in her other poems mm -hmm. that um, there's very conscious turns of language and image that are cinematic um, and thematizing the cinematic so it doesn't surprise me to yeah, see it in I, Yeah. I had not noticed that with singing and groaning, and maybe I just wasn't paying attention. I was caught up in something else. So with this one, I really felt I, I like don't I remember was in the movie. I don't remember the title, but there was one in particular in which you could see through a window, and she mm -hmm. was seeing herself from the outside in the twilight through a window and that was pure huh. cinema right huh. there huh. i wish i could remember which one that was <laughs> well if i could find the book and yeah. that's yeah 
So would we find that in your reviews? So if we Google, Robbie, your reviews of Judy's I, books? I don't remember whether I mentioned that particular poem, but that okay. was in Groaning and Singing, I believe. And okay. well, you, you know, you could read them. I believe that uh, the one I remember offhand, the most recent one was in Rhino. The review. Awesome. That was a review of Groaning and Singing, wasn't it? Yeah, was it in Rhino or was it in Valparaiso? It was in Valparaiso. Okay. Yeah, they won't publish my poems, but they, they'll publish my yeah, poems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's very good. Yeah. Thank you. That's <laughs> so often true. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. Uh, Judy, thank you again. And I'm going to move us towards open mic. Let me get my list of readers. Um, Shamala, Shamala, I'm coming towards you. Okay, um, need to find that poem. Sick. Okay, um, very different mood, but um, you know that's okay. Um, thank you again, Judy. Uh, this is about language, um, in my home country. It's called "In Many Tongues." The best of Malaysians sound hesitant. We say ah and could be, maybe and perhaps, or isn't it at the end of every other sentence. This is how we make space for each other, a diverse people, each speaking and thinking in many tongues. Constancy, you see, is for politicians and debates, a dangerous thing that takes no account of humanity, foibles, difference, Conversation requires space. One says, aha, and pauses. So another can say, could be, <laughs> but do you think? And both, all, every person who dips into the sea of difference gently walks away richer, more aware. We code switch with every conversation, change speech patterns, even the pronunciation of our own names depending on who we're talking to and what their languages and thoughts are. This isn't dishonesty, but radical inclusion, before there was a fashionable word for it. Of course, it is a recipe for losing oneself, but only if the inclusion is not returned. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. Kamala, that is gorgeous. Please look in the chat section. It's all lit up. Yeah, gorgeous. And I've lost my place. I've been tearing up coming to you. So. Wow. Apparently, I lost my place also. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. This is um, Heart Dance with Marriage Story and Travel. The moon is bold enough tonight to be saving her full-on shine for Beltane, but her rippled reflection is so almost perfectly round in Smith Mountain Lake's dark eye that the Canada geese have traded their giggling in for a fallen hush, and we all, all of us, even the family members I usually refer to as them rather than us, all of us sitting at lake's edge in folding chairs encircling the pit of our rented fire hold each other's breaths and cry at least a little in so much joy and in so much love with the so of it all of all of this <laughs> the so of it all i love that and what a title that's fabulous thank you karen and thank you for always co-hosting and making sure if I get booted off my rural internet, it still keeps going. I'm, uh, I somebody love it. Asked for, I'm so grateful. Somebody asked for the list. So I'll read through it. Catherine, Robbie, Hetty, Juan, Regina, Robert, and Pua Ali'i. Um, and if I missed you, send me a message. Catherine, I'm coming to you next. Okay. Thank you. Um <clears throat> this is uh, titled Memories. Memories of the neighborhood where I raised my children, and they learned about crossing busy roads, building forts, the value of baseball cards, 
selling lemonade, playing chess in the shade, the economics of shoveling snow, what stuffing bras might attract. Hide and seek became monsters in the dark, football dreams of grandeur, swimming pool gossip and slander, skipping school and being cool, bicycle ramps and neighborhood tramps, computer games and secret flames, driving cars, looking at stars, fireworks on 4th of July, running in the rain or through the sprinkler, skateboards and rollerblades, Michael Jordan sneakers and Calvin Klein jeans were all the craze. <laughs> ah, thank you, Catherine. Yep, playing chess in the shade. Yeah, you need to look at the chat section. Okay. Robbie, I'm um, heading you. your way, Robbie. Okay. All right. Ancestors. My ancestors became adept at leaving, traveling by ship, sinking low in dark green winter waves subsisting on shreds of over-salted herring. They learned new languages, took on different names, yet carried with them the tales and histories that made them who they were. I imagine that they sang on the trip over, spinning wild fables in the ship's dark hole. But later, they had to go again. Each sanctuary gave way to the next. Even knowing what they knew, they hoped there would someday come an end to leaving. Oh, Robbie, that is gorgeous. And I think several people at the same time, I, ma I imagine that they sang. Make sure you go to the chat section because... Thank you. I it's, love that, that our open mics are fire and that people are in the chat section letting people know all the things that resonate and speak to them. Hetty, I'm coming to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Judy. I'm speechless, really. Uh, it's so hard to talk about all of those things that we have to face. And uh, you're giving me some courage to try to do some. Uh, so I don't know what's happening. I Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I got a strange message that I couldn't figure out. And thank you very much for all the, the other poets who just read. Um, I'll be reading a poem from uh, The Taste of the Earth that came out in 2019. And I'm in the mood of uh, reading a poem titled, Writing in Dust. Let's weave braids of dust, rich with time's unspeakable debris, broken voices, whispers, dry tears, insect swings. Doesn't most of it come from our discarded skin? Or is it the residue of fleeting breaths hidden in pillow edges and seams, my kitten's fur conjuring my old cat's scent alive in this impalpable, minute form? And is it true you can clone someone with just one hair, one speck of flesh, all of which hovers around you? Some say, don't clean too much. A house full of dust is a sign of laughter of good times spent forgetting how to clean. Some say chasing spider webs in every nook and corner isn't helping while unaware of those nesting in one's mind. Let's shake the dust in our heart, watch it fall like snow in a crystal globe, paint open shutters, let the wind in, or think of what we might write in our own dust, as on a sandy shore, express the unthinkable, unravel what informs that dust, let it settle at will, heavy as sand in an hourglass. Oh, that is gorgeous, Hattie. 
Again, I'm going to remind you to check the chat section because the, the, let's shake the dust. I love that invitation. I also like the idea of uh, it not being healthy to chase after all the dust. It's <laughs> webs everywhere. Thank you for that. Uh, Juan, I'm coming to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Judy. And I'm going to read a poem that somewhat, I think, your poetry make me made me think about it. It's, uh, it's not very new. It's called A Letter I Won't Mail. Every hour belongs to a certain day. But there are moments, single atoms of time, hurtling inside memories, whether they allow a long breath or they cause significant destruction. I know this is the moment when a poem ought to offer some relief or leave you a little less uneasy about your life. But I can't in good conscience, say something that would stitch what is still torn. Thank you. Juan, that is amazing. I, I You know, I just realized, like, uh, tonight I almost feel like the poems and what Judy kind of set in motion is speaking to something about, like, the courage it taught, takes uh, to speak our truths and to show up. And and when we do that, we give each other permission. And I just think that's amazing. So thank you all thank you. Uh, for doing that. You know, and yes, that line, I know this is the moment when a poem ought to offer some relief. I love it that y'all are willing to look in the hard places. Thank you. Regina, I'm coming to you. Hi, everybody. Um, so this poem tonight um, was actually inspired by something um, our our featured speaker talked about, a featured poet talked about earlier. Um, this is Holy Week. And so Holy Week uh, for me brings a lot of introspection, um, which leads to also a lot of just kind of looking around. This particular poem is going to be published in Brownstone Poets Anthology. Um, the epigraph, um, usually epigraphs, when I use an epigraph, it's usually um, from a song and usually it's in my key, but this one is not. <laughs> but we're going to give it a shot anyway. Many rivers to crawl but I can't seem to find my way over. Wandering I am lost as I travel along the white cliffs of Dover. For when we cross, for when we cross that river, there shall be war. As we find the land of more ceaseless night, we had no idea how dark it would be. Broken cars and bodies littering roadsides, scorched or burned out. And we cannot see the greater misery that lives beyond the celebrated killing and the dying. For we now exist in the spaces where glorifying the conqueror is the aspiration of the strong until they are conquered. Minds continue to become the vessels of degrading truth. Will becomes fixed in folly, wrapped in dollars. Tongues become triggers that teeth and lips pull and souls lie bleeding and unattended. My spirit circles in the boat that moves in a fretful sea. I search the stars for answers, for those caught on dark shores. I search the stars for answers, for beloveds, for the conquered, for me. There mm -hmm. is war on every shore, yet I believe the stars. Mm, Regina, that was gorgeous. And uh, yeah, my spirit, my spirit circles in the boat that moves in a fretful sea. Yes, there was so much to that. 
And I love hearing you sing. Yeah, my, Juan <laughs> just wrote, my goodness, Regina. I think that's actually perfect. <sighs> goodness, Regina. Thank you. Um, Robert, I'm coming to you. And I saw that you asked me about screen sharing. Um, yeah, yeah, you can forget that. I, I'm not going to do that. So. Okay. I picked a different one instead. Um, this one is from an anthology that came out in 2022 called the Waco Word Fest uh, Anthology 2022. And the theme for that anthology was just Earth, write something about Earth. And I hate writing to themes. So I thought, OK, how can I both stick to the theme and undermine the theme at the same time? So this was the result. It's titled, From Where I'm Standing. God moves in the ash at my feet, a mirage of myself. I breathe deep, wonder why it took me six days of words, when I could have just snapped my fingers, big bang the whole damn thing into existence. The wind sucks thought from me, tosses singed confetti into Michelangelo's vault. Adam's finger not quite touches God, and we shall make man in our own image, I hear myself say from the high places, and we shall give him mastery. Around me, Yellowstone burns, Venice sinks. Words buzz in my head like bees in the carcass of Samson's ruptured lion. I crack my jaw wide as heaven, forfeit responsibility for this speaking to the wind. Over the land, a hush comes. Water weeps upwards. I rub thumb and middle finger, no snap. The wind throws caution back at me. I pick up my rod and my staff. Sorrow, thorns, and thistles, the sweat of my brow. Feed my sheep, I say, beating back the flames. The beginning is still beginning. I move upon the face of the waters. Thank you. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bob will be reading um, at Robbie's event and there uh, it's words with you. And there's a link in the chat section if you want to make sure you catch that. And again, Robert, check the chat section. It's it's on fire. Um, our final uh, open mic reader for tonight that I wrote down, if I miss somebody, you'll have to correct me, is Pua Ali'i. And I'm coming your way. OK, so I don't know if uh, you're going to be able to see me on video because I actually have to go to my notes. So I'm reading on my cell phone. So I'm going to move over there and then you can tell me if you can one, hear me and two, if you can see me. Um, let me see, where did I put that? Hold on, please. There it is. OK, can you see me still? Yes, ma'am. You're good. All right. Fantastic. It's called a sea of gray. Down the corridor, bobbing and wheeling, unsteady gray hairs navigating back to their beds, calling them after a delicious assisted living lunch. My dearest grandmother found it amusing to, to sing song toodaloo as we glided by them with her waving fingers. She's throwing deuces to 80-year-olds and chuckling in her 101-year-old impression of Mario Andretti peeling out at Daytona 500 before the fragile 70 year olds realize they've been spoofed and bested by the queen of age. She has a spry 56 year old driver who laughs and spurts at the hilariousness of it all. This wasn't just a one-time thing. I actually think she enjoyed ribbing them <laughs> in that way that people who've got it just a little tiny bit easier, not with malice or cruelty, but a real genuine poke of smug. No harm intended, but the outcome a blast for one who used to stay busy because life was so full of fun. It's her turn. In her last hours of physical plain life, I learned so many wonderful stories about her eight months buckled, buckled to a body that just simply wore out. Things get creaky and aches screech. Hey, what you doing? We strolled around the assisted living joint on many days, me thinking, my grandma was alone when in fact, true to form, she's brightening people's lives, just being her dear, wonderful self, kicking the place into gear by her sheer age, smile and amenable sweetness. 
most people don't meet 100 year olds because I had one. It doesn't dawn on me the anomaly of it. A jolt into another's reality sure has me curious. How did I navigate before she turned 90? Much less 100. Just like I was every grandkid in the neighborhood. Oh my gosh, we had so much fun. We had serious talks about our hearts. We'd play cards and laugh and snack and get banana splits from Brahms, a Midwest ice cream store. I have memories that include my grandfather and ice cream and pizza I'd bring home when I was a delivery driver at 18. My, how good times do fly and papal times create a scar. Some scars heal, some linger longer. Only the one with them, only the one with them decides. Another beautiful day in the books, peaceful, calming, good night. Ah, gorgeous. And, I, and it did take you off of the video, but I didn't want to interrupt. And you did a beautiful job. And I also wanted to say, yeah, a lot of people were saying, feeling this with you, it's beautiful. And I want to take a moment to say, all hail the queen of age. <laughs> it's been an awesome night thank you judy for setting such a powerful and beautiful tone thank you to everybody who showed up <laughs> yeah make sure you see the comments pua ali'i i will make sure that i don't uh click too quickly out of here so you can read um, okay yeah old ladies rule they do <laughs> thanks robbie <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, everyone here rolls. Um, thank you all for being in, uh, being such good company. If you did not get a chance to um, figure out how to click in to get Judy's next book, you can reach out to me and I'll make sure to connect you. Be well, and I'll see you next week. Guys.